Hello, race fans. Welcome back to Off the Record. I am your host, David Schildhouse. Joining me today, we got two drivers to talk about road course racing and a whole host of other things as well. Joining me is the driver of the number 34 Ford for Front Row Motorsports in the NASCAR Cup Series. That's Michael McDowell. And as well, we have the driver of the 31 for Jordan Anderson Racing in the Xfinity Series, Myatt Snyder. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here today. Myatt, I want to start with you. Uh, Portland, we were there, it rained and you had yourself one hell of a run. Now, those that pay a little bit closer attention to your performance on road courses shouldn't be surprised last season, you put together some very good runs on the road courses and you come out of Portland with a stage win and a very exciting second place finish. I know you've probably talked about it a lot by now, but I want to ask you myself and for our audience here, just what did that run mean for you? Yeah, it was so awesome because, uh, you know, this this team here at Jordan Harrison Racing is uh, only about a year and a half old. So uh, to get the first stage win and almost nearly the first win for the race team uh, meant a lot to me. And, um, you know, as a, I didn't ne necessarily come from a road racing background. I started at Legends Cars and Bandolero, so I was always a circle track guy. And I always ran ovals all over the place. But I always loved road courses no matter where I went. Um, and that was kind of driven home when I did a season of, um, NASCAR Euro racing in 2019. And that really kind of taught me to refine a lot of the skills that I had and to really kind of eke out the most performance that I had. And so, uh, yeah, it um, that race definitely meant a lot for us and it was a lot of fun. And, you know, we earned the second most uh, points out of anybody on the day is a really big day for a whole race team in the treetop uh, Chevy Camaro team. So looping into the theme of road course racing, Michael, you had yourself a great weekend at Sonoma as well. It was really exciting to watch you wheeling and dealing up inside of the top five. And that shouldn't, again, surprise a lot of people if they know anything about you. That's something that you're sort of known for is your road racing prowess. And to go out there in Sonoma and run in the top five, that was a great run. But it's been a stretch of great runs for you. But especially here uh, at Sonoma on the road course to go out there and, and have a run like that. What did that do for you and your team? Yeah, it was a great weekend. I think that overall for us, it was probably the best weekend from a performance standpoint that we've had as an organization, you know, from start to finish, from practice, qualifying, race, running in the top five, top three most of the day. So, you know, for, um, for us, it was big. It was an important weekend to run well, but at the same time, wasn't much of a surprise. Um, and like you said, the last four or five weeks, we've been really building some momentum with a lot of top five finishes and and having speed everywhere that we go and so you know it's hard to describe um, to, to people that don't follow the sport closely but when you're running 25th every weekend on the ovals you're not in the cup series going to go to a road course and all of a sudden win it just doesn't happen I mean because it takes a group and it takes cars and a team and speed you got to have that speed to be able to do it. And if you're 25th every weekend, you're not going to just go jump in and do it. And so with the way that it's been going this year and the speed that we've had and the execution we've had on pit road and all those things, um, we sort of knew that we might be in position to, to have a run like we had at Sonoma. And so uh, it was a lot of fun. I think that we were close. We needed a little bit more to actually contend for the win. Um, I was hoping that the, the 17 and 99 that would battle a little bit more and, and bang some doors and, and give me an opportunity to sneak by both of them. But, um, you know, that part didn't work out, but it was a great weekend. And, and for us looking to the future, we know that we got Road America coming up here in two weeks and we can use a lot of what we learned at Sonoma and apply that there. And, you know, I feel like we will have a shot at Road America. Um, so looking forward to the next few weeks and, and trying to get a, a playoff spot, man, there's, there's only a, a handful of them left and it's, it's tough to get. I'm glad you brought those two points up about Road America and playoff spots topics. We're going to touch on a little bit later. Um, but Michael, to go back to Sonoma, you talk about the strong run from the 99 and the 17 ahead of you, you had a good seat for that. But as the laps went on, it's just like their pace never slowed down. And, and certainly the 99, his pace was impeccable. Even the 17 couldn't keep up with them. What is the difference? Is it drive off? Is it front end handling? Uh, what What is it that separates those two cars from what you were able to do? And what more did you need maybe out of your car, if anything, or maybe it just wasn't able to compete with them? Yeah, so I think there's things that we, we could do to improve you know, our car's balance and finding some speed. 
Um, but what's interesting, and I'll dive in a little bit further, is the 99 wasn't great in the beginning of the, the race. Um, and I don't know if that was just track position related, but he was falling off really hard at the end of the run. And so I thought that, man, even with him up front leading, he's taken off pretty hard. He's going to come back to us. Um, but he did a really good job of, of not, not pushing his tires too hard. And when I went back and watched the replay, he did a good job of keeping the 17 somewhat close to him, but wasn't really pushing himself super hard until he had to. Um, so he played it well in that regard. Of, I think he learned from those first two runs that he couldn't push it as hard as he was because he fell off really hard those first two stages. So um, he did a good job of adapting and changing. And I think for me, I probably gave up a little bit too much on the front end, hoping for the back end. Um, so what I mean by that is that restart after that first lap or two, I knew I was pushing my stuff too hard to stay close and I wasn't really in an opportunity to pass him, and I was burning up my stuff doing it. And so I just backed it down, hoping that he would continue to push hard and eventually would come back and he just never came back. And so if I could do it over again, I probably would push a little bit harder on the front end, hoping to maybe make him make a mistake or get, get myself in that, that lead position. Um, but really, we needed a tenth or two to be, um, you know, where we needed to be to do that. We weren't quite fast enough. Um, and Daniel did a perfect job of executing. You know, he just didn't make any mistakes. And um, I think he was a bit better. The 17 was definitely better than both of us, I feel like. And he had more of that that ebb and flow where he burned his stuff up and last two laps he was coming back to me I think another lap I would have had him I mean he fell off really hard um which I thought that the 99 would as well but he he did a good job of managing his stuff it was an impressive run for sure uh for for all of you I mean there were there were a handful of cars that were really really good and you were certainly one of them and I want to go to the other side of that now Mike you've had a little over a week to sort of think about process Portland probably play through a hundred scenarios in your head of what you may have done differently battling with AJ Allmendinger there in the closing laps and and that final move that came through the the right hand sweeper where he got the lead from you is there anything you would go back and change at this point now that you've had some time to think about it I think uh, I might have been a little more aggressive in a couple spots, but, um, you know, like I said in the interview post-race, you know, to me, that was hard racing and, you know, you can, you can go back and analyze it six ways to Sunday. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's um, <clears throat> for me, for me, you know, that's, you know, the only thing I think I would, you know, tend to be a little more aggressive about is just thinking, all right, you know, you know, we're not as well-funded of a team as uh, something like a colleague racing. So, we um, we've got to take our chances when we get them and we've got to, you know, maximize everything that we can get. And I think we, you know, did about 98 percent of that. It was just that one little move where AJ got me. And I um, I think my next best opportunity was in the next couple corners to get him back for that. And I kind of um, I was thinking that, you know, at the time that I had a better launch onto the backstretch than most people all day. And I was going to utilize that. But he managed to set it up just a little bit better than me that time. And he's able to get down the backstretch. Um, and I think that's what made a pretty big difference. And so he was able to just get out of range of where I could get to him. And, um, you know, I think that's the only thing I think back to. But, you know, for me, what also I learned from this is that we have, you know, I feel like a really good shot at these road courses to make a difference, um, especially if it rains. And so I'm excited for that for our playoff hopes. Well, I'll tell you, I was standing there on the spotter stand in turn seven, uh, watching you lap after lap and, and I'll spot for Anthony Alfredo. He was out of the race at that point. So I was able to watch the battle that you were having and I'll agree. You got off a of turn seven better than almost any other car, say for maybe the 54, uh, throughout that entire race. And so I was watching the run to six, the left-hander, uh, expecting to see a bumper put to him, uh, for the contact that was made for him to get around you. But it just didn't happen, and and it was good racing. And it seemed like your car just got better as the track dried out. I think a lot of teams were dealing with that. They weren't so great in the wet, but once it dried out, they were really, really strong. You were certainly one of those. And that's that was a huge shot in the arm, and, and it's fascinating. You talk about the things you have to think about and consider as you drive being on a smaller team versus a, a mega team like a colleague racing and all the resources they have at their disposal. It's been a running theme we've talked about on the show. Uh, so it's not just going out racing as hard as you can every lap. You have more things to consider. 
Michael, do you have to do the same thing driving for Front Row Motorsports, or are you past that point now in the team's evolution over the years to where you don't have to worry about that so much or at all? No, we're not past that. I mean, it's an important part of um, our season. If if we go a string of races of tearing stuff up or, or you know, Todd and I both tear stuff up, I mean, it puts us behind and it puts us in a jam and it only hurts performance. And so I'm never in a position where I can't go for it, if that makes sense. I just got to be calculated when I do go for it. And so if you're running ninth and there's a lap to go at Charlotte, burying it in there for eighth and hitting the fence isn't worth it. If you're running second and you're going into turn 11 at Sonoma, you go for it. I mean, it's not like I have to think about that part of it. So, you know, it's not it's not a, a hindrance. It's just you got to be smart. You got to make it count when it counts. You know, if if you're battling hard for the lead and you're trying to hold track position, you know, it matters. If if you're not, then, you know, getting tore up, um, you know, it, it's not worth it. So it's a bit of a balance. It's not a free for all, if that makes sense. Um, but at the same time, I don't feel like it's hurt, hurt us. It, it can, though. Uh, in years past, I've had it. I've had. Um, too much damage happened in the organization and it actually hurt my program, even though I wasn't tearing cars up. Um, and so it's an important part of it. It's not, not something we can just go and, and, uh, have at it all the time. Um, but we are really strong here at front row. We have the people and we have the parts and pieces to do it, but you know, at this level, any setback just hurts you. Do you think that, the switch over to the next gen car has changed sort of that approach for everybody in the garage, or is it still, you know, the bigger teams are going to be perhaps a little more laissez faire with what they let their drivers do, knowing that, you know, they may be able to recover cars and put cars back together faster than maybe a front row motorsports. I think that the teams um, are sweating bullets. I don't think all the drivers are. Um, you know, there, there's definitely, I think that now we're getting into a better place as far as parts and pieces for everybody. Um, but early on, man, it was, it was slim pickings and it was tough. And so, um, yeah, you could see moves on the racetrack that you're like, Ooh, I'm not sure that that was the best decision or man, they lost a lot of cars in a short period of time. And that's really going to hurt them. Um, but I think everybody's managed, you know, I think that what's changed, more this year than in years past is just how quick you can turn a car around you know there used to be a four to six week turnaround for a car you know you'd run it this weekend and you wouldn't see that car for another four to five weeks um, with this car I think you can turn it around much quicker and I think guys were having to do that you know where they didn't have a fleet sitting back there to turn around for us it hasn't changed a whole lot we've been like this for the last 10 years uh, this is how we've operated right and so uh, we, we haven't had a fleet of 18 cars sitting there ready to go that all been wind tunneled and, and ready and decaled and set to go. So this is fairly normal for our routine. Uh, but the, the first few races were definitely stressful for a lot of people. Yeah, I know that was a big concern coming into the season was if we tear up a bunch of cars, you know, you lose a car at the clash. Everyone probably was figuring they were going to lose a car in the clash. Uh, and then you go to Daytona right after that where anything can happen. You know, what what could the trickle down effect be? And I think for the most part, most teams avoided that. Not everybody, but most teams avoided that. And, you know, as we're now halfway through the first season uh, of this next gen car, perhaps some of the fears and, and you know, doomsday prophecies at the yeah. start of the season haven't been necessarily realized but that that danger still is very very present as you said if you get in a string of bad races you could be in a tough jam um my you were with richard childers racing last season now with jordan anderson racing definitely a big change as far as t uh, team size resources available uh people processes all those things what what's been sort of you know aside from the obvious what's been the biggest difference that you've noticed switching from a richard childress to a jordan anderson racing well yeah uh like you said not stating the obvious um the obvious stuff is that you know there's a difference in resources and difference in in manpower here but um i think the big difference for me is just the change in character that i've seen um, you know, going from a place like RCR to uh, Jordan Anderson's uh, team. And, you know, I've, I've seen Jordan spend a lot of late nights at the shop and I've seen, you know, the dedication that he puts in and, you know, just seeing that just kind of inspires me to want to do my job that much better. And so 
Uh, I formed a lot of really good relationships here and I've really enjoyed working here. And um, it's a lot of fun to race for this team because, you know, we're a, we're a pretty tight knit group and we like to have a lot of fun with, you know, going to the races and, you know, it's um, it, 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 you know, I have a lot of passion this year to make this team uh, be what it can be. And so I've really enjoyed working with everybody. And um, I think that's just the biggest difference for me is the culture. And so uh, that's been a lot of fun. And, um, you know, I, I think that this team can only continue to go up. Awesome. We'll continue this conversation with Michael McDowell and Myatt Snyder on the other side of this break. Get into some stats, break things down a little bit and talk a little bit more about road courses, playoffs and just life in general on what may not be always the biggest team in the NASCAR garage. You're listening to off the record. Welcome back to off the record. And we're going to talk about some stats. I pulled up some stats. I did the hard work here that any, you know, journalist would do. Um, I'm an accountant by trade. I'm not a journalist, but I did get some stats. I like numbers. I'm a numbers guy. And so Michael, I'm going to start with you. You're 20th in the points right now. One top five, six top tens, one DNF, You've led 38 laps this season. You are the fifth car out of the playoffs right now by 93 points. At this time last season, you were 16th in points. And I found this interesting as I got these numbers together because I was surprised. I was absolutely surprised by that. Of course, you won the Daytona 500 last year. And and I think that helped you a lot in, in the point standings. But as I've looked at your performance and you alluded to it earlier in our conversation, it's been really strong this year. And I, and I've, yeah. I've seen it myself at the races I've gone to, um, got a running joke with your, your PR guy, John, about when I show up to the racetrack, you usually run really well. And he's like, yeah. always wanted me to come back and hang out in the pit box on Sundays to make sure that you get a good finish. But I told him, Hey, you can still run well. Cause I wasn't at Sonoma, but, uh, I looked at these numbers and I was definitely surprised by that you don't feel like a 20th place car when you think about that. It, it, does that surprise you? No, it doesn't surprise me for a couple of reasons. One is that early on in the season, um, we lost probably 30 or 40 points, you know, at, at California, we were in the top 10 with 10 laps to go, had electrical fire, ended up finishing like 35th, right. Um, whatever it was, uh, Las Vegas <clears throat> ended up stuck in a bunch of, uh, debris and, hurting the motor and finishing 30th right so those were two that we were running in that top 10 and probably gave up you know 40 points total the other side of it is is that we haven't been very good at scoring stage points and I think that you know that's the big difference maker um, as far as that goes because when you look at the guys Denny Hamlin like Denny Hamlin wouldn't be within 50 60 points of us if it hadn't been for all those stage points that he scored He's had such a bad season from that standpoint of getting finishes, but he's been so fast that you win three stages, 30 points. Right. And, and so that's the, the big swing is not been scoring enough stage points. Um, and then also too, I think that this car, there's been more cars on the lead lap at the end of the race. And so when you have a mistake, like we've seen, right, like seen Tyler, Tyler Reddick last week, or even the week before at Charlotte, same, like have something happen, blow out a tire. Well, he's still on the lead lap. He doesn't have to get the lucky dog. He doesn't have to wave around and he still finishes 12th. And you're like, well, man, that last year, that'd have been a 25th for him. And so I think that that's probably the biggest difference, even though we've been executing and getting better finishes, um, everybody else can recover from mistakes a little bit as well. So that's part of it. But I think nowadays stage points are so important. Um, You know, at Sonoma is tough. I mean, we obviously gave up a lot of stage points. We could have stayed out there and probably got, you know, 18, 17 points from the day as far as just stage points. But if you want to give yourself the best chance you can at winning, and the best chance for us to win was to, to pit early there, give up those stage points and be in position that hopefully the 1799 run into each other and we can squeeze into the lead. Um, so, yeah, I think there'll be more opportunities, though, o- over the next four or five weeks where we can score some stage points without compromising so much um, that you do at a road course. Um, but the fact is, is that you know, we're four or five spots out of the playoff. I think it's a pretty big swing. We're like 92 points out. So it's going to take a win. No doubt. It's going to take a win. Um, But what's interesting this year, different than last year was last year, everybody that was in front of us 
is who we expected to be in front of us. Now there's cars that we're ahead of that are in the playoffs already because they have a win, which is a little bit, you know, unusual for us. You know, you got cars that we're probably pretty close to speed wise, you know, week in, week out that have won a race, you know, like Kurt, you know, I think, I think I'm ahead of Kurt in points too, or pretty close to it. Uh, but he's got to win. And then you just go down the list and you're like, well, Denny's got to win. And, and these guys are all uh, right there with us that um, have already kind of locked themselves in the playoffs. And then you got guys like Amarola and Harvick and all that, that have been executed and scoring a lot of points that haven't had a win. Um, so it's a little different this year, how it shakes out. I think it's not your typical point standings as of this point. You know, I think about Denny, Denny last year, he was leading the points the entire year and was looking for that, that win, but was still going to win the, the regular season. Right. And this year he's got, luckily he's got a win, but other than that, it's falling apart, you know? So um, just different how it's flowed this year. And then also too, you got Ross and, and Daniel that have been running so strong. That's two cars that, you know, weren't there last year in the, in those spots, you know? Yeah. It's been feast or famine for a lot of those guys, but certainly a, a strong group of drivers who, either won last year and haven't won yet this year, or you expect to win and haven't won yet this year that, you know, and for you, you're just like on team, no new winners, right? No new yeah. winners. You got to, <laughs> you need to get a win of your own. And we're going to talk yeah. about those opportunities that you might have coming up. My, let's look at your stats. And the reason I went into this is because as I started putting this together, I just noticed you both had very similar seasons on paper, just stats wise. So my, here you go. You're 18th in points, one top five, four top tens, two DNFs, 21 laps led one stage win. You're the sixth car out of the playoffs right now, 98 points down on yeah. the playoff cut line. So obviously if you get that win at Portland, that's huge. I mean, you're in at that point, I think in the Xfinity field, after 14 races and, and not many left before the playoffs start a win, you're, you're really comfortable and in. What do those stats sound like to you halfway through the season? Yeah. You know, and I had the same thought as, um, as you, you were talking to Michael about his season, you know, with the, at the very beginning um, we had a lot of strong runs that were kind of, you know, just this close to being great runs. And then they ended up being poor runs at the end of the race. So I look at Daytona, obviously, and everybody knows what happened there. Uh, we were running, we were going to finish like third to fifth. So that would have been a great start to the season. California, I was passing for, I was passing actually uh, the 54 for eighth place. And then we popped a tire. Um, and then when we did that, it actually damaged the front clip of the car, but in a way that we couldn't see at the racetrack, like didn't, didn't with like all the toe lined up and everything like it was fine it was only when we took it back to the shop finally that we were able to learn okay this actually this is actually damaged and so uh the that car drove terrible and so i could hardly run the 25th all day um <clears throat> and then phoenix we were kind of experimenting with some setup stuff trying to get it a little bit better um richmond has never been my best racetrack so we weren't too good there um but it, and then Atlanta, we were actually leading the race with four to go, got spun by the 98. And, and that was another instance where I'm like, man, we're, we were just so freaking close. And then Coda ended up with a uh, sixth place finish, um, Talladega ended up with a ninth place finish. In Texas, we were going to end up actually with a, um, a top 10 finish. We actually had a parts failure in the rear end that um, kind of made the car drive way worse than it had the whole race. And so we ended up about 20th i think 22nd and then um but really the last like three four races we've been in contention to have top tens every time and um obviously charlotte got a top 10 and then portland got a um a second place finish and so uh it's been a lot of you know ups and downs and roller coasters um and just little little stuff that we've had to learn as a team and you know like i said before this team's only a year and a half old so there's still a lot of things that you know uh, you know, at a team that's well established, it, it may, you know, these routines may be already in place, but here we've had to kind of uh, work hard at, you know, making all the, you know, the prep consistent and all that. And I think Shane Whitbeck, the crew chief, has done a really good job at organizing all that. And so uh, that's just a little stuff that we've had to work on. But, you know, I really do feel like this team has a lot of potential in it. And, um, you know, it, I think we're really going to have a really strong summer summer stretch, especially with these all these road courses and all these racetracks that I've run good at historically. So let's take it one step further then, Maya. You talk about, you know, the little team that could here with Jordan Anderson racing. 
year over year. So compared to last year, uh, halfway through the season. So it's not a full, you know, year to year, but take it for what it is. Your average starting place this year is 13 places lower than it was last year, but your average finish is only three places lower than it was last year for all of last year. So going from a team like Richard Childress racing to a Jordan Anderson racing, that's only a year and a half old. How big of a compliment is that to hear something like that, where the starting, you know, average starting spot isn't as great, but your average finish is not far off of where you were in that two car. How big of a compliment is that? Do you think to, to Jordan Anderson racing? I think there's uh, two kind of uh, sides of the story I could give here. Um, I think one I've had to work a lot on myself as a driver, as far as, you know, just how I approach a race and, you know, just kind of being a little bit calmer and how I approach things and not letting, you know, you know, one thing gets me. I think a lot of things would, you know, kind of set me off at last year during a race and it would kind of, you know, throw me off, spin me out, do all this kind of stuff and just make my race in general worse. And I would, you know, do it to myself a lot of times. And so I've had to work a lot on that and I feel like I've run a lot better races in my head uh, this year. And so I've worked on that a lot. Um, and uh, the other side of the story, as far as the uh, average starting position goes, is that we've transitioned, obviously, from uh, metric qualifying with all the COVID rules to real qualifying this year. And uh, to think about it, if I, I thought about it, you know, when we started doing this, because I wasn't really all that pleased with my qualifying either. Um, you know, I, I got to think about it and I was like, man, it's actually been two years since I've qualified an Xfinity car. You know, we've had, I think, one qualifying run at Charlotte and then um, all the road courses and then Phoenix and that was it. And so other than that, I had hardly any qualifying runs in an Xfinity car ever. So that's something I've had to work on this year a lot. And I feel like I've gotten better at it. Um, and we've also worked on the qualifying balance stuff a lot, but you know, definitely, uh, some things I'm learning as a driver and some things I've gotten a lot better at this season. And now Michael, I don't want you to feel left out. This is a fun stat. I think you're going to like this. Your average finish right now for 2022 is about plus three from where it was last year. So you were averaging about a 20.47. This is according to NASCAR.com. Uh, 20.47 average finish last year. Right now you're at a 17.31. What what does that tell you? Yeah, we're going the right direction. And, um, you know, it's, it's I look at averages too because I think at the end of the year, actually every week I put the averages in and, and keep it kind of running is, you know, you want to be better than you were the year before. And, you know, I think two or three years ago, my, my goal was like twenties, right? Like if you could get, you know, down into those twenties or in 19 would be awesome. And, and we're, we're going the right direction. And then you see crazy stats, you know, where, um, the guys that are really, really good at this are for their career in the teens. And I'm like, man, that is impressive. Um, so I think it's fun to look at. I look at all that stuff. Um, I look at, because uh, I think it tells you a lot about where you're going and how you're progressing. I look at total points scored too. You know, last year was a great year. Like you said, the 500 was big and we scored a lot of points. Um, and then like Maya was talking about that qualifying uh, metrics that they use, that helped us a lot because next weekend we started second and you just keep that going, right? Because it's based off of your last run, where you're at in the points and all that. Well, if you start that off right, it is really good for your season, you know, and, you know, this year with, you know, typical qualifying, traditional qualifying, you've had to do that on your own, right? And so it uh, makes it a little bit, a little bit harder as far as that goes. But, you know, I think that 17, 15, that number is like really good uh, when you look at an average because you're taking into account those 30ths and those 37ths and those weekends you have something happen. Um, so it's, it's fun. I mean, like I said, this is the best, this is the best that I've ran in my career, most competitive that I've been. And, um, so I'm enjoying it because it, it was a grind for a very long time. Well, the numbers don't lie. I mean, you can go further back than, than just last year and see the average finish for you just keeps improving. Going back to 2018, it was in the 24s. So it's been yeah. big, uh, big gains for sure. And, and that's, uh, yeah, I like the numbers. Good to know your numbers guy too. We'll keep the conversation rolling forward on the other side of this break. We're going to look forward to road America coming up in a few weeks and what that means for both of our guests on the show. And stick around. You were listening to off the record. Welcome back to off the record, continuing our conversation with Myatt Snyder and Michael McDowell. So we've got road America coming up uh, off week right now for both of you. 
and then we get back into it, Nashville Super Speedway, and then back to the road course. And that's really what I want to focus on is the road course stuff, uh, because that's been a track that's been favorable for both of you. So we already highlighted probably going to take a win for both of you to get into the playoffs at this point. Might you almost won Portland and road America is a place that eh, wasn't that great to you last year. 23rd last year, Michael, you're a former winner in the Xfinity series at road America. Uh, so for both of you, as you look forward, this is a track that is either an opportunity to, to back up something you've already done, Michael, in your case, or might for you to improve, but build on what you did at Portland. So might I'll start with you. What from Portland translates over to Road America? What did you learn last year uh, that you can translate as well to this year? Because this seems to be a good opportunity for you to get that win. Well, as far as what I learned at um, Portland goes, most of that was in the rain. So um, I definitely am really, really hoping for another rain race because I always get excited when it rains in a road course. Um, I'm sure uh, Michael is the same way. Um, but the... Um, as far as what I've learned at Road America over the years is that it always seems to catch me out just at a turn two or turn one, because I, I always seem to find myself running really well right there, kind of later in the race, you know, anywhere from 10th to fifth. And then I get caught up in somebody else's mess. So I don't know what the deal is with other guys with them wanting to wreck off a of turn one, but uh, it always seems to happen. And I always seem to get caught up in this. So I think this year, if I see any sort of anything that will sketch me out going out of turn one, I'm going to back way out of it and just let everybody else crash because it, it always seems to happen. But no, I, I like Road America. It's a lot of fun. It's one of my favorite road courses that we go to. It's definitely, you know, a kind of nit, a nitty gritty type place. Um, but it's it's a lot of fun, really fast. And it's uh, one of the best road courses we go to by far. Yeah, it's beautiful. Big four mile facility up there in Elkhart Lake. Great fan turnout. They love their racing there. And, and, you know, of course, NASCAR has put it right there in, in 4th of July weekend. It didn't used to be there when it was just, you know, the Xfinity series, but you bring the cup series there. They've made a spectacle out of it. I remember last year people showed up in droves. I mean, it was a well attended event. People loved it. And, and Michael, for you as a former winner at road America and the Xfinity series back in 2016, uh, coming to this racetrack, you got to have high hopes now after the run you had at Sonoma, right? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, for me, it's one of my, it is my favorite road course that we go to. And even prior to my NASCAR career, it was, I mean, uh, um, you know, being from Phoenix, Arizona, I grew out in up in the uh, the desert or the concrete jungle. Uh, no trees, um, no green grass except for on golf courses. And so, my first time in Wisconsin at Road America, it's like you look around and it's just amazing elevation, green, plush. Um, and so, I've always always loved going there and, and had some great success there. And um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely a big opportunity. Um, you know, last year we, we were decent there, didn't get the result we wanted. Uh, we kind of tried that strategy. You guys saw, uh, the Toyotas do on Sunday at Sonoma. We knew we weren't going to win the race. We were running about 13th. And so with three, four laps to go, we went ahead and pitted, hoping that a caution would come out and everybody would come in and we could stay out and try to sneak a win out. Um, so we, we were, you know, living on the edge there kind of hurt us getting a top, you know, 15 result, but it's been a great racetrack. Um, you know, sat on the pole there that first time I sat in a Joe Gibbs car. Um, and it was a, a fun race that all, all went to haywire the last green, white checkered. I had like a nine second lead, um, coming to the white flag and somebody had spun out or run out of fuel and three green, white checkers. I was in the grass and finished, 15th or something so um it's been a place that has had a, a lot of fun but a lot of heartache too for me um but it's um you know it means a lot it's going to be a fun weekend and great fans and i'm looking forward to this next gen car you know this year when we went to coda we really missed the setup at coda and i was so discouraged of like man it's a road course we finally got the same brakes we got the same car um we should be running really well you know kind of what we saw at Sonoma is what I anticipated. I anticipated being in the top five and running there all day and we just really missed it. And so, um, having Sonoma where we hit it, I'm feeling more confident going to road America that, all right, tire fall off, same tire. We kind of know what we need to do. Um, and hopefully we can, we can do what we all anticipate. And, uh, but it is a tough place. The research there, like my, was talking about turn one, it's very narrow. Um, not a lot of runoff, the runoffs of gravel traps. So gravel traps pretty much 
end your day as far as track position goes if you go off. Uh, and then you bury down into turn five and you get three or four wide and it all funnels down to a 90 degree corner there. And so a lot can happen, uh, especially on the starts and restarts there. And so, you know, it's, it's a tough place. You got to execute perfectly. It's a track that is famous for uh, late race restarts, chaos, and and surprising winners. Of course, Jeremy Clements comes to mind. Brendan Gaughan comes to mind. Paul Menard uh, were all winners at Road America that we weren't expecting to see. And uh, so, heck, I mean, both of you could add your names to the list uh, here in a few weeks as well. Why not, right? If they can do it, why not you? You know, just don't be involved in the wreck. Just be right behind it, you know, right behind it and squeak on through. Make uh, make TV go crazy shouting your name as uh, as they call you to a checkered flag and, and you both get locked into the playoffs at that point. But, you know, three road courses um, and Daytona are really what's left before the playoffs. Uh, I, you know, you talk about, running 25th on ovals, you don't expect to show up and just run well at a road course, Michael. Is that how your team really approaches it? If they strategize and look at the schedule from here until the start of the playoffs, you say we've got three opportunities at road courses. We've got uh, Road America, Indy Road Course, Watkins Glen, and then we have Daytona. We've won at Daytona before in a different car in last year's car. You know you get around road courses really well. Are you just all in on those four races and say if you know we get – 15th place runs everywhere else, you know, we'll, we're okay with that. Um, yes and no. I mean, I, there's definitely tracks that we highlight that like you just talked about the ones you mentioned, but the way that this season's gone and the speed that we've had, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think like that as much, you know, when, when I look at gateway, we were legitimately fast enough to win that race. Um, you know, obviously we got up there with some strategy, but at the same time, you know, I think we could have won that race. And so I look at Nashville as an opportunity, not, I mean, I won't say it's the same as road America, but as good as we've been running, you know, Nashville's an opportunity. They're all an opportunity. Um, Daytona, you don't want to put your eggs in that basket, man. That's a tough race, right? It's tough no matter what, you know, and, and I love, I love how it's always like, Oh, anybody can win, but you look at the stats and that's not the case, right? Stats show otherwise, um, same guys run up front and win those races and they're tough, tough races to win. So you don't want to have, you don't want to wait till the last one. If you can get it done before, then that's for sure. It's something you want to do, but I'm not make or break as far as you know, the road America, you know, Watkins Glen's really strong for us. Indy strong. Um, but like I said, I'm looking at Nashville. I'm looking at Pocono, um, New Hampshire, probably not looking at that one. Not my best track. Uh, short flat tracks have not been our thing this year. Um, but, you know, I do feel like there's some opportunities. And, and I think Atlanta is a wild card. You know, Atlanta, the new surface now with this car, it's more or less like a super speedway. I wouldn't call it full super speedway. Um, but anything can happen, you know. And so there's, there's a couple of races that I think can be pendulum swingers. Um, not just for us, though, either. You're talking about those first time winners. You can see a first time winner at any of those places. Um, and so you can very quickly run out of playoff spots in the next five weeks. Right. Well, my, all right. So that approach, maybe not what uh, Michael and his team are looking at employing, but does that better suit you and your team? Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, I think we, the Xfinity series obviously is a little different um, considering that, you know, some of these races can be a little bit more um, wild card in their tendencies. But um, the good thing I think for, for us is that a lot of these racetracks that we're going to over the summer are great racetracks for me historically. So uh, next up is Nashville. I mean, that race, I was, um, I didn't have good luck there last year, but we had a lot of speed. Um, all the road courses, obviously, I feel like I have a really good shot at, you know, getting a top five, top 10 at those races. So, um, and then uh, I think we go to, and the Xfinity schedule is a little bit longer before we get into the playoffs. I think it's not until mid-September, at, uh, just after Bristol. And I think um, we've got, let's see, we've got New Hampshire, Michigan, Pocono, um, Kansas and Bristol. And those are all great racetracks for me. Um, I've had good runs at pretty much every single one of those. And I've always had a lot of speed there in the past. So um, is a win realistic? 
it's a long shot, but I feel like we have a chance. Um, I'm not certainly going to rely on that, but I do feel like if we continue the streak of top tens that we've been having and even top fives on road courses and maybe even throw in a few stage wins there, we definitely have a chance. And um, I think one thing that we can look at is that actually, um, even though it doesn't mean much for us right now, um, 17th through 13th in points are all separated by eight points. So if those guys all have one bad weekend this summer, I'm within, you know, spitting distance of 12th in the playoffs. So obviously 12th is a little bit further away, but it's definitely something that I've been looking at the last couple of weeks uh, or since Portland as, you know, an opportunity that we have. And so for me, I'm kind of like Michael, I'm looking for, you know, just consistency and we've been really good at that the last couple of weeks. So we just need to continue that. Excellent. Well, consistency is key. We'll wrap this thing up on the other side of our final break. Get some closing thoughts from our two guests. You are listening to off the record. And we're back with off the record. We'll close this thing off. Uh, I want to give you both an opportunity to sort of shout out your favorite thing about the team that you're with. You know, this show is about talking about the teams, the smaller teams, the midfield teams, the teams that don't always get the spotlight and drivers always bring an interesting perspective. Now I know there's some stories that we just can't tell, but uh, Maya, I'll start with you. What is something that you would love for people to know the racing fans out there to know about Jordan Anderson racing? I think the thing that I've noticed the most about this team this year and the thing that I appreciate the most is just kind of like the, the tight knit atmosphere and the passion that's behind this race team from really every aspect. So, you know, a lot of this team is made up of young guys, young guys who are hungry to, you know, make something happen in the sports, myself included, Jordan included, everybody who works on these race cars, they're full of just drive and they, and we want to succeed in the sport. And I feel like we have, brought ourselves so far, even just from Daytona. And so it's amazing to see that level of commitment from everybody. Um, Jordan, um, John Bomarito and everybody from tax Slayer and Louisiana hot sauce, Spear six, everybody at treetop who supports this team, you know, they support it because they love racing and um, to see that level of commitment and that level of passion from all these people, you know, kind of like I said, with me seeing Jordan spend so many late nights at the race shop just really makes me want to do my job that much better. And so uh, it's hard to know when you're not in racing to, to, you know, know the amount of dedication it takes to make this happen. There's a lot of times where you just, you know, you're, you're so frustrated with, you know, X or Y or Z and how this is going or how that's going. And, you know, it's um, lesser people would quit at, at that. And I feel like there's, you know, none of that in this team. And there's, there's a lot of, a lot of drive to make things happen at this team. And that's what I've appreciated the most by far. Well, you certainly were challenged right off the rip at Daytona as, as it's been well documented and talked about. And that's not, you know, that's hard for any team to get past. And so I think it showed a lot of what Jordan Anderson racing is made of to, to take that situation and move on uh, and show back up at the racetrack the very next week and, and be ready and, and act uh, like the true professionals that they are. So that's very cool. And, and Michael, you know, front row motorsports has been around for a while now, right? We've seen him in the cup series for a long time. Um, and, and in various States, as you had said, you know, it's, it's always been sort of an interesting watch to see what this team is doing, but certainly gains have been made. What do you attribute that to? What, what is going on inside of front row motorsports that is elevating it? Is it the next gen car evening things out or is it something else? No, I think it happened even prior to that. It's just, um, the culture and the mindset changing of, uh, you know, just being there versus being pushing yourself to be more competitive every weekend. And, um, and so that, that mind shift and that culture has really changed over the last four or five years of, you know, not just getting to the racetrack because for a period of time, that was half the goal was just getting to the racetrack, but getting there and performing well and, and building, you know, slowly. And it's been a, a slow build, but, you know, the last three years has been fun to watch this team really take off and, and, have good results and um and then too just how that affects everybody at the shop you know how that affects the culture at the shop and you know when you ask when you ask guys to stay long and do more and and or redo something or change something like you do that enough times and it not produce a result and they get tired of doing it and so to have it actually produce results makes it like 
everybody here is on fire, right? Everybody here wants to go that extra step and put that extra time in. And if it, if, if it matters, we're going to do it and make the most of every opportunity. And so seeing that culture and that mind shift change here over the last three, four years has been a lot of fun. Um, and then, you know, like Mike was talking about, this is a small team. Like it's a, it's a family atmosphere. Like when, when we're at the racetrack, I'm, I go to dinner with my guys, we all hang out. Like uh, we do life together because it, it literally requires you all of you. Right. And so you, you got guys that are bought in that are um, spending time away from their families and their friends and working extra hard um, to have this type of performance. And I think that that happens probably in every team. And I sort of understand that, but at our team, like everybody has more than one job. Nobody's just coming in and plugging away and that's it. Right. Um, nobody. I mean, every single person here has multiple jobs um, compared to who we're up against and how they do it. And so, you know, it's it's fun to see people dig deep and, and want it. And it's also fun to have results and it makes it more rewarding. You know, I think about Daytona 500 and I know that that's the granddaddy and it, and it means so much to everybody. It doesn't matter how big or how small you are, but just envision for a second a team of 70 people that have been grinding it out for 13 years, winning the granddaddy of them all and what that means. And I'm not saying that, that Roger Penske doesn't enjoy it any more than we do, but he knows that he's going to win five more races that year. That might be the last race we ever win, but it was the big one. And I think that that, that feeling last year um, really helped elevate our whole program to the next level where, um, you're never going to duplicate that, but we want to do it. We want to be there again. We want to be able to win races and what that means. And so um, it's been fun to be a part of the journey here. Uh, it's certainly been evident on the track that uh, your performance has been improving uh, leaps over bounds from where it used to be. Of course, when the Daytona 500 was a great story, we want to see more of that. I can, I, I can't speak for everybody out there. I can only speak for myself, but I can tell you, I want to see more of that. I want to see more front row motorsports wins. I want to see more Jordan Anderson racing wins. Uh, and, and that's, that's what I think we all, maybe, maybe we all want to see, maybe not everybody does, but, um, I, I think it's good for the sport to see things like that. And, and to your point, Michael, a team that's been working and grinding so hard that nobody expected to see, you know, anything from then show up and win the Daytona 500, you know, the Super Bowl of, of stock car racing is just, it was the coolest thing. I loved it. And so um, I'm, I'm happy to see that y'all are, are improving the performance. It's definitely showing on track uh, that just remember that average finish, the other stuff, you know, not as important, but um, right. I appreciate the, uh, the time from both of you today for sharing these stories and talking about racing. Wish you all the best of luck going forward for the rest of 2022. Look forward to seeing how you guys get on and, and see if you can make it into the playoffs and cause some disruption to the norm go give those guys a run for their money don't make it too easy for them now you know they get comfortable up there you got to go take the fight to them but um well that'll do it for today's episode a big thanks to my guests Maya snyder and michael mcdowell uh, i've been your host david schildhouse thanks so much for watching here on youtube or listening over on spotify and if you have some feedback and you want to give it or you have some topics that you'd like us to discuss in a future episode make sure you head over to the youtube platform Look up tobychristie.com and, and leave some comments down below. Love to hear what you have to say. Thanks so much for watching. We will see you the next time we go off the record.